Hey friends, welcome back, or welcome for the first time, to the Don't Stifle Me podcast. Open conversations with guests based in, but not bound to, the music and entertainment industry. I am your host, Jacob Stiefel, a singer-songwriter from Fort Payne, Alabama, now based here in Nashville, Tennessee. Now, for these first few episodes, they're going to be sponsored by yours truly. I have three CDs on iTunes and other digital music outlets, uh, along with there is merchandise and my own tour dates, all up at jacobstiefel.com. That is www.jacobstiefel.com. And the social medias are at Jacob Stiefel on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Okay, okay. You can stop reaching for that skip ahead button. <laughs> We're getting to the show right about now. In the office, at the desk today, one of my favorite songwriters, the producer of my first two CDs, and one of my oldest Nashville friends, Mr. Drew Smith. Drew and I discussed his path that got him to where he is today, some of the details about you know being a songwriter here in Nashville and what that you know contains, and the process behind him having songs cut by both Randy Hauser and Merle Haggard. That's right, Merle Haggard. <laughs> Along with his work in radio and producing and mixing albums and demos for other artists, it was a it was a great talk, an informative talk, and one I'm very happy to get to share with you right now. Here it is, my conversation with Nashville singer-songwriter, Mr. Drew Smith. What do you think about my setup here? I love it, man. It's great. Pretty good. It's very good. You've done well. Drew Smith. We're already recording. You didn't even Are know that. Are we? Okay. I, I can't you. see because there's a glare yeah. that's blocking. The, all I can see is the compressor at the bottom. Oh, okay. So what's new with you? I know you, um, are you on a publishing deal right now? I know you were. Yeah, man. I write, for, um, I write for Demolition. How many publishing deals have you had? I know you were with Anchor Down, right? Yeah, this is, um, this is publishing deal number three. Okay. I was with Anchor Down for uh, three years that I was with, um, I was with Benny and the Big Guy for a year. I've now been at uh, Demolition for a year. And, and you know, have had some space in between those. Right. Uh, I took about a year, year and a half off, something like that. I didn't didn't take off completely, but I wrote a lot less for a good amount of that time. So when, when, did, you first, when did you first start writing songs? When was the first song you wrote? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, I was probably... You know, I was I, I was probably ten or so when I started like writing things down. Yeah. Um. But it probably wasn't until about twelve or so that I started, you know, really putting things together, verses and choruses, and, and yeah. things like that. Um. And I did that quite a bit. I mean, I've got my mom. I think still has mold notebooks. You know, from from when I was like 12, yeah. and just full of stuff, you know? So that was really when I started. Um, and, and I got pretty serious about it when I was, you know, probably 16 or 17 is when I really started making a point to finish songs. Yeah. You know, cause for me it was always, you know, I had a verse and a chorus and then I never could get past that chorus. And so when I was, I guess about 16, 17 years old, is when I really, you know, focusing on finishing the song, mm-hmm. you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. I wanted to finish the song. Right. Um, it so. is. It is the hardest part sometimes. <laughs> it is. I, I mean, to this day, something verse and choruses. Yeah. And, yeah. To this day, it's still the hardest part for me. No. I've, I've, does I've, it need a bridge? Does it not need a bridge? Right. I don't know. Is my point right. across? I really said everything I need to say in the first verse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's part of it, too. You can, sometimes you can say too much. Yeah, so then you really, so you're starting to put them together at 17 and 18. When, so you grew up, take it back even further, Lawrenceburg? I grew up you? in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. Yeah, Lawrenceburg, I was born and raised in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. Were you Amish? Um, there were... There's times Amish people that, in Lawrenceburg. Yeah, there were times that um, 
I, I probably could have ended up Amish. Um, my, my parents, I'm sure, wanted to drop me off at the Amish community a few times. But <laughs> no, definitely not Amish, but, but grew up with a lot of them and, yeah. uh, or grew up you know, around a lot of them. So when did you leave Lawrenceburg? Um, <laughs> which time? Uh, when did you first like, yeah, move the off, first time you? I left, I was 17. Okay. Um, I was 17 getting ready to turn 18. It was the first time I left. I went to Muscle Shoals, Alabama. Oh, Muscle Shoals. What'd you do there? Uh, I worked in radio down there. I worked at Big River Broadcasting, um, for Sam Phillips. Sam was still alive at the time. Oh, that's awesome. So was he like around in Muscle Shoals, like at the radio station? Or? Yeah, he would, he would come in at that time. He was, um, he was still in pretty good shape. I mean, he was nearing 80, I guess at that time. Yeah. Um, and he, he would still come in and, uh, he would Man. just kind of show up. Sometimes you would know he was coming. Sometimes you wouldn't, but, uh, I just can't of, imagine knowing. I mean, I know Sam's son, we, we know Sam's son and, and granddaughter yeah. Hallie and Jerry, but I can't imagine knowing Sam Phillips. Like he's a great guy. Yeah. That's um, so cool. I, I mean, he was, he was absolutely a character and, and you knew it immediately. Yeah. He wasn't, he wasn't a guy that you had to figure out. Sam was just Sam and all the time. Yeah. Uh, he, he at least was with every experience that I had with him. So did he hire you there? Uh, he didn't, he, he didn't hire me himself. Um, he just kind of flew in and out and made yeah. sure everything was going. Yeah. He just kind of yeah, came in and out. And I mean, he was still living in Memphis, of course. And, and, um, so he, you know, he didn't make it over that often, but, um, but he, you know, he'd sneak in from time to time. What did and, you, what did you do at the radio station? Were you DJing or? Yeah, I started off DJing and, um, that sexy voice you got over there. I don't right? know, nobody's surprised. <laughs> I don't know about all that, but, um, yeah, I started off DJing and, uh, I started off, uh, on Q107, which at the time, uh, was, uh, like the number two adult contemporary station in the nation, hmm. which was a cool thing for us. I mean, it was a hundred thousand watt station. So it was a big station. It had a ton of history. Sam started that radio station, I, th- I believe in the seventies. Yeah. So wow. at, at that time, you know, it had been around for it was you know, established years. Yeah. So I, I started off part time doing that and was doing overnights, and then eventually um, got moved over to their country station and had a few shifts over there. And then I ended up um, being assistant production director over there, uh, which pretty much just meant that I handled uh, a large majority of the commercials that would come in. Okay. And I would either record those myself or I would distribute those to other disc jockeys and, you know, let yeah. those guys uh, put a voice on them so you didn't have the same continuous voice on every commercial. That makes sense. Yeah. So did, at this point, you were, you know, knee deep in radio stuff. Was that, at your at that time, was that your passion? Was that what you wanted to be doing? And Yeah, I, I mean, I loved radio, but... Really, music was my passion, but radio was kind of the catalyst. You know, okay. that was that was my way of getting to be around and listen to music all day, every day. Yeah, I get that, and get paid for it. You for know? sure. I remember being like <clears throat> ten, twelve years old and setting up my CD player boombox in my room, and had my CDs lined up on the shelf in alphabetical order, of course. Oh, yeah, got to be. Yeah. yeah. And I remember putting on, like, headphones and hanging something over in front of the radio and acting like I was DJing. Like, up next, we got ACDC. And then after that, ACDC. And then, <laughs> <laughs> and then Elvis. And like that. But, uh, but, yeah, I get that, wanting to be around the music and be involved yeah. in it however you could. So, it, But you knew... You wanted more to do with the music? Yeah, I, I knew that I wanted to be more involved. I mean, and, and I was writing then. Um, and I remember you you talked about uh, Jerry Phillips, uh, Sam's son. I got to get I, him and Hallie in here at some point. Right? Oh, yeah, right yeah, there. they'd be great for this. Um, I, I remember I played a, a song for Hallie once. And she's like, I got to play this for my dad. And I thought, dear God, please no. <laughs> He's the son of rock and roll. Right? Please don't play him this. You know, we were like eighteen, I think. Yeah. And I'd written a lot of songs at that point, you know, but that that didn't really mean anything. Right? Yeah. That you're, yeah. That's still going to. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't rock make and roll it good. royalty blood. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
So, but yeah, radio was fun, man. I, I loved it. I, I think, I think if I, you know, for whatever reason decided that music was no longer what I wanted to do, I think radio would be an option. So how long were you at that station before you moved? I was on? there for a couple of years. Uh, I worked there a couple of years and then, um, the thing about radio is there's not much of a living in it unless you're on a, a really, really large scale, you know, such as like syndication. Right. There's not, if you're on 30 I stations imagine you across could get the by, US, but it's probably not, <clears throat> if yeah. it's a small station, it's probably not a whole lot of room for growth. Yeah. And movement. even that was a, you know, that was a, a larger market station, um, or is a larger station in a smaller market, but, um, yeah, you can survive, but it, it it's one of those things that if you if 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 you want to put a a pool in the backyard, yeah, you've either got to be really good and and be syndicated and be on you know thirty stations right. across the country, or you you know should probably get into the corporate world. So, what did you jump onto after after radio? A lot when of stuff. Um, you know, I was a high school dropout, so I I didn't. Uh, I didn't have a diploma, so I, I went back and I got my GED and took my ACTs and all that. And I ended up working in a chemical plant for a while, which was an absolute nightmare. I yeah. hated it, every bit of that. I worked, I did that for like six months. I painted mm-hmm. houses with my uncle. Uh, I sold cars for three months just to... Car salesman. Car yeah, salesman, yeah. Drew Smith. Come on down, everybody. I sold Toyotas <laughs> um, just to prove to my dad that I could. Was that back around Lawrenceburg? Yeah, that was actually in Columbia, Tennessee. Oh, okay. And um, I started in January selling cars, and it was terrible. Yeah. I mean, it's January, man. It's right after Christmas, yeah, and nobody's buying nobody cars. Buy car. <laughs> and so it was, uh, but I sold like five cars my first week. Oh. And um, which was, you know, to me was a lot for someone that's never sold cars before. That was that was a lot. I would think, it, yeah. So, it, you know, it was fun for a little bit, but um, I, I honestly, I didn't care much for it. But my father always said that you know if if you can if you can make it 90 days you know yeah. you, you can you can do anything and hmm. if you can make it in sales for 90 days so that's a good point i made that's it like 90 days and then i bolted all right i'm out. out of there so i um i ended up getting my gd and my took my acts and all that so i could get all that stuff and and that way if i ever needed to you know um get any kind of job that required that I would I would have it yeah luckily selling cars or working in a chemical plant doesn't really require that yeah so so did job job from job for a little while when did you say all right I'm I'm gonna go for the music thing like well you know I, I talked to my family about it and I said you know I I I really want to do the music thing and they were they were pretty hell-bent on me having a backup plan which I mean you know, is, is never a bad idea. Yeah. So because I'd gotten my GED and, and, and did my, what en- I, my engineering degree is hanging on the wall right there with a crack on the, yeah, it's got a glass. crack in the frame. Yeah. yeah. It's a metaphor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> my la- my laundry door, which fell off, fell onto my degree on the wall and cracked it. And I thought, you know what, that it's a we'll sign. just leave that there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a sign. Um, so they wanted a backup plan. Yeah, they, I mean, they they thought it best that I get a backup plan, and they were right. And so uh, I ended up going um, to community college and and got my um, got my uh, medical license. Was working on an ambulance. I was EMTIV for several years, and or I say several. It was a, a few years. I think and when you call me, it still says something something ambulance service. Yeah, that's crazy. We talked about that. Yeah. Why does it say that? Face, it's got to be Facebook. It's got to be. Facebook's everywhere. Facebook, Facebook and Google. The, yeah, just, Facebook's the, the devil, so it's everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I did that for a, f- a few years, and uh, but I started working up here because I thought, okay, if I, if, if, I can, if I can start working in or around Nashville, you know, surely to God, there's, I'm going to meet someone somewhere. Uh, that will have some sort of insight or an right. in or something. Mm-hmm. And and that's exactly what happened. And um, I ended up meeting the guy that I, I worked with that uh, his wife was in. He came in one day and he had this this bag and it was a uh, it was a CRS bag. It was a country radio seminar bag. And came I knew in, he came in where? He came into work. 
Okay. And um, he's, you know, so he's in his uniform. And oh, okay. We're, we're getting ready for, yeah, yeah, okay. We're getting ready to get on the ambulance and go to work. And I, yeah. I said, and I knew from my time in radio that you didn't just pick up those bags just anywhere. I mean, this right. was like a nice duffel bag, you know. I said, man, where'd you get that bag? And he said, well, my, my wife uh, is a radio promoter. And so she goes to CRS every year. And I said, oh, cool. So we start talking about that. And man, it was um, <laughs> just a matter of time before I ended up doing some radio promotion um, with, with she and her just through that connection, just through that yeah. connection, which was a, a great experience. I was just doing it, you know, a couple of days a week and it was just a, it was just a really good experience. But because of that, I ended up, um, I ended up doing some gigs and, and just one thing kind of, it just, it, it really snowballed. So up until there. this point, had you done any like playing and singing out live? Any acoustic yeah, gigs? Yeah, a, a little shows? bit. I mean, mainly just, you know, open mic stuff. And then, um, and then I got more into doing, you know, cover band stuff, you yeah. know, downtown Nashville. And so when I did that, um, it, that was another thing that snowballed. It started off with just, you know, like one day a week. Yeah. It's like on you know one of my off days from the ambulance. And well, and, we need you to fill in. Yeah, yeah. And it became two days, <clears throat> and then three days, and then it was you know pretty much any moment that I wasn't on the ambulance, I was playing. Yeah. And um, <laughs> I, I was working night shift one night, and my boss called me, and um, he used to play for the Oakland Raiders years ago. It was a guy named Mike Ross, and he called and he said. Um, he said, man, he said, uh, I know this music thing is what you really want to do. And he said, you know, a lot of people don't understand the dream and, and having to chase it. He said, but I understand it. I get it yeah. because I've done it myself. And he said, um, if this music thing is what you want to do, you better do it because you're young. And if you fall on your face, do it now. Yeah. it's not a big deal. You get back up. And he said, but this is not what you need to be doing. He said, I, I want you to take, I want you to take a few days and, and really think about, you know, the future and think about where you want to be and what you want to do. But I understand that, you know, music is, is your love and it's your passion. And that's, I think that's probably what you need to be doing. And he said, uh, if, if you want out of this, you can go, man. He said, I, I want you to, I want you to be able to at that's least awesome. try. That's a great, that's a great man. Yeah. It, it, and it was, and he said, you know, try it for a few months, man. He said, if anything happens and it doesn't, if it's not going your way or if it doesn't fulfill you, then he said, call me, you got a job here. Ah, that's great. So yeah, it's a good feeling. It really was, but it was, and you know what? I needed it. And, and like, I don't know, man, like two days later I quit. Yeah. And maybe two days after that, I flew to Key West and the songwriter festival thing? Or no, just I, I just, I, I ended up going down there and, and doing like a week of gigs. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, so, uh, I, it, that was, that was the push that sounds I like it was a, it was a pretty good transition. I mean, it in, was, into, yeah. you know, you had the yeah. job little by little, did you know, some radio promo stuff and some gigs started coming in and yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good transition. That's easier than having no connections whatsoever and just jumping in and not knowing where to go. At least you kind of had somebody yeah. that kind of helped you. Yeah. And, and, and I got lucky too, you know, because I had, um, the connections that I, that I did make were, were reputable people. And that, yeah. that doesn't always happen. It's um, true. Um, it's in, in a town this size and with the amount of people all trying to do the same thing, you know, some sometimes you end up with uh, in situations that are that are not always good, and um, I I was very blessed and very fortunate to to be able to meet and know the right people and genuinely good people and people that had a great reputation here and that had been successful here and actually knew what the hell they were doing. Yeah, you know. So did you? Once you quit the ambulance thing, were you going for the artist route or the songwriter route? Or I, did you, you know, know? Or was it? I, man, I just wanted to write songs. Yeah. And and the artist thing really just kind of happened by accident. And um, 
I mean, really by accident because I just never, the fact of the matter is as an artist, I'm really not that good <laughs> and I'm okay with that. And, and the, w- what I've found is, is that the, the appeal that I have as an artist is because I don't, people don't really think that I sound like anyone else. Yeah. You hear that, you hear that voice people out there listening. That's, that's Drew Smith. And like, there's no way that cannot be good. <laughs> but you know, it, so uh, that being said, I've, I've never, it kind of, uh, in, instead of going, Oh man, well, I'm, I'm not any good. You know, I don't, I don't need to be doing this or I don't want to do this. I've just kind of embraced it and went, you know what? Fuck it. If, if, if they like it yeah, and, and if it's different and it's appealing, it, whatever, I'm going to go with it. It's interesting to me talking with different people, how some people songwriting is their number one thing. And maybe the artist thing happens and maybe not, but songwriting is what they, you know, what gets their rocks off. Or yeah. Whatever. And then some people it's the recording process. They love recording. They love being in the studio and coming up with the music and the, sing and the vocals and then some people it's live live performance and there's just it we're all different man you know we are and you, you know i think that i'm fascinated by all of it and and that's you know in the past it probably hasn't suited me well to be fascinated with all of it um because i'm so add that it's you know it's well okay well i want i, I want to sing this and then but I want to write that and then I've got to record this on this day and then I need to mix that. And, you know, so, feel you. but if you, you, if you find traits. a, if you find a balance, uh, I, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be taken from each of those things that I think you can use with the other. For you, sure. You know, um, you know, for, for example, just with my, with my recording and my, my, um, producing experience, uh, I guess the grammatically correct way to say that would be my, my experience as, as a producer would be um, what I've taken from that is that when I'm writing, sometimes I look further ahead mm-hmm. than what I used to do. And I, I would, so now when I'm writing, I try to find or I try to create an opportunity to maybe do something cool musically or something different. Yeah. Musically. Whereas before you would have just been writing the words. Yeah. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, you're out, you know? Yeah. And now it's like now because of producing other records and producing other projects and, and mixing demos and mixing records and things like that. And just having those experiences. Now I look further down the road and, and, and instead of just that moment of writing that song, and instead of it just being verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, and outro, and that's yeah. it, I now go, okay, inst- maybe instead of doing a bridge here, can we do something cool musically that's different, that's appealing, that's equally as catchy as the melody, or right. uh, that, that affects you as equally as, as the lyric? Or maybe instead of going for, you know, verse, chorus back into a verse can let's do let's get weird and do something like verse chorus and then you know this b section that's its own thing it's not a bridge it's not a chorus it's not a verse it's just a b just section something cool just yeah. something cool and different yeah that just comes out of nowhere and it, it kind of lives on its own but it it it's it, it works and it, it also lives you know in between all these other things that came with the experience of, you know, being involved in all the facets of it. Yeah. And not just the writing or just, yeah. The, yeah, for sure. I see that. Um, so when, so which, uh, which started, I guess, what, how did, what did got you into publishing deals, like writing songs for, <laughs> for people? Well, you know, um, you know, just to be honest, I was just in the right bar one night and you know this as well as I do, as long as you and I have, have, um, played, you know, on Broadway right. downtown, th- there's, there's so many guys that came before us that, uh, and that are huge artists now that, that played on Broadway you know, Dirk Spentley played Broadway for years. You know, yeah. So, I mean, a long list of artists. 
Hell, Gary Allen played Broadway just a yeah, few nights ago. Was, did he? Yeah. We, we played like an hour and a half at the stage or something. And somebody else that used to play like a duo, Thompson Square or somebody. It might have been Thompson them. Square. Yeah. Craig yeah. Campbell is another yeah, one. Yeah, Craig. Lots yeah. of great artists played on Broadway at some point. Um, but you and I know that it's it's not that what the reason for their success was not because they were playing in a bar on Broadway and the right person walked in. Yeah. That's not how it's it a, happened. It's a small, small, you know, cog in the huge wheel of right. their right. You know, career. I mean, that's that's that what they're doing there is really getting experience and cutting their teeth and figuring out who they are as an artist mm-hmm. and performer. For sure. Um but that's not that's typically not at all how it happens in my situation. And a lot of people have, you know, if if you watch the show Nashville, you see things like that. And and so a lot yeah, of people have the shit. idea that you go downtown and you play on Broadway long enough and hope that the right person walks in and all of a sudden you got a record deal and now you're driving a really nice truck from Carl Black Chevrolet. And yeah, you, if you're listening to this and you think because you watch the show Nashville that you're going to move here. And you're going to play at a bar downtown for six months and then write a song and become a millionaire. It's bullshit. Stay home. Figure but, it out. Yeah, yeah figure, figure out if that's really what you want to do. The, the only reason you should move here and, and attempt that is because you love music. You love playing music. You love writing music. And if it takes 10 years, that's still what you want to do. But it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's... uh. And I okay, think I'm going to get off my soapbox. Sorry. No, I'm with you there because I, I think that even even for people that have realistic expectations, I think there's still a part of them that, that thinks that it, it will move more quickly than what it does. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, but as as far as songwriting deals go. Yeah, I, I was I was playing a bar in in uh, West Nashville one night and this uh, this publisher very reputable publisher and his wife came in and we're having dinner and plenty of drinks and um uh, i was playing with wade battle oh wade and things were great at that time you know in in that world because um in color was just starting to oh that was to come off time. the charts okay. and yeah so it was a there was a lot going on sure and um Wade uh, Wade Battle played guitar with Jamie Johnson for years and years, and well, he was a co-producer on that yeah. album, right? Yeah, sure was. And co-writer on yeah, co-writer on a lot of the stuff. songs. Um, Great yeah. talent, incredible talent. Yep, yep. So it was, you know, so I was in that camp at that time, and I'd been running around with those guys, and um, I'm checking my fluid situation over here in case He's you're got one of these little electronic cigarette things. So are you still off the off the real cigarettes? I, you know Hitting what? This. You know what, man? I smoked a Marlboro Red yesterday. Yeah, that, yeah, it happens. And it it felt really good. And I I've was been listening to uh, Mark Marin's podcast. And do you ever listen? Have you ever listened to his? No, no. Um, well, he he had Keith Richards on oh, his podcast. Okay, well then and I will listen yeah, to that then. So Mark, I I haven't listened to this one yet, but my friend was telling me about it and. Marin has been off cigarettes for like, I don't know, 15 years or something, something a long time. And, but Keith Richards came in with his pack of Marlboro Reds and was sitting across from him and he's like, chain smoking. Smoke? Yeah, chain smoking. And he kind of motioned at Marin and said, like, you, you want one, one of these? And Mark was like, ah, I'll just hold it. And so he just held it for a little while. Then at some point Keith was lighting up another one and he kind of like held the lighter out to, I guess, ask if he wanted to light it and Marin was like ah fuck it all right it's Keith Richards yeah like who's gonna say no to that yeah here's the deal if you're my mom was sitting with Keith Richards (laughs) and he offered her a cigarette I'd be like mom you smoke that cigarette you have to smoke (laughs) it yeah yeah if 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 you are an ex-heroin junkie and Keith Richards walks in and says, hey, would you like some heroin? You go, of course, yeah. yeah. Sure, it's going to ruin my life. But you're <laughs> Keith Richards. I have to. Yeah, I know? don't smoke weed on any kind of regular occasion. But if I was on Willie Nelson's bus and he right. said, hey, uh, you want to hit this joint? Yes, sir, Mr. Nelson. Hand it yeah. over. Yeah. yeah. Where were we? I don't know. We what got started we talking, talking about, about cigarettes. Oh, you started checking your electronic Oh, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, but we were talking about... Your oh, publishing yeah. deal, yeah. First, so, yeah, yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm in this bar and I'm playing, and and this this you know very reputable publisher comes in and um, with his wife, and they have dinner and drinks, and so Wade and I were 
at that time we were, I guess, between dates with Jamie or, or something, you know, yeah. it was like a Wednesday night or something. And, um, anyway, we finished playing and, and, you know, this, this publisher approaches me and, um, and he says, uh, he said, man, you know, we, we really love your voice. And, and we heard, you know, a couple of the original songs that you've done and, we really like those, and so you were uh, mixing your songs in with. Yeah, I think someone had requested some originals, and so yeah. we did that, and and um, so he said, you know, let's let's exchange numbers and let's talk, and um, I had uh, Wade had told me, you know, he said, hey man, that's you know so and so, that's so and so, and I said, you know, okay, who's that? And he's like, well, you know, they have this number one out right now, they got this and this guy right. How did you there, know Wade? Guy. Um, you know, someone, someone introduced us actually was John Scott. Okay. Um, I had known John Scott who had played keys for Jamie Johnson for a long time. And John's one of the most talented people that I've ever met in my life. Ridiculously talented. He introduced me to Wade and I think we were at studio big, I think is, is where he took me one day and they were over there. Uh, it was Wade, and it was um, it was Big T, the guy that owned the the studio. He was a great um, producer and and engineer, uh, mixer. Yeah. Um, in the in the Jamie camp, um, it was Big T and Wade and Kendall Marvel was over there. Kendall's written some great hits. He's a great artist and songwriter. And there were several guys over there, man. It was just there was. I think Jamie was there. And so anyway, John walks me in and introduces me to Wade and, um, and we just hit it off, you know? And I, I remember I was sitting on this couch behind the console and we're, we're listening to some demos they had just cut. And, and the, I remember the energy in that room. Now at this time in color was at its peak. Oh, wow. so these guys, that are there and they're in high. this camp. They're riding high, man. They're, it's the best moment of their life. Yeah. And, and they were, they were humble and they were, they were happy and, and excited and th- they were still the same dudes that they were a year before and five years before and 10 years before. They were just some good old boys. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's good to hear. That's that cool, hung man. around long enough, you know, but I remember that energy. I remember sitting on that. I was sitting in the middle of this couch behind the console and I'd never, I'd never met Wade battle before in my life. And, um, uh, I'm sitting there and, and he walks by and he goes, uh, he, he goes, you're a good looking, you're a good looking kid, man. <laughs> and, uh, I said, thanks, man. He, he said, I want to hear your stuff. And so I gave him a copy I, I brought. John had told me to, you know, bring a few things. And yeah. I gave it to him. I think they got on the bus that night and he texts me and he's like, holy shit, man. So wow. I'll be back in a few days. Let's write. I said, okay. Nice. And that was the beginning of our, and we were for years after that, you know, for probably the next five years, I guess we were inseparable. Um, but, you know, his, his presence um, did a lot of things for me because he was, since he was, you know, um, a great guitar player and a co-producer on, on that record and a co-writer on a lot of those songs on that record. He, he just, he had a lot going on and he was one of the most sought after guitar players and, and writers in town at the time. And because of that, and because of his energy, um, and his reputation, just m- my association with that bumped you up a couple of notches. Oh, yeah. d- dozens of notches. Yeah. You know, without even trying. That's awesome. So, you know, as much as I would like to take credit for any kind of success that I've ever had, man, it's just between, between God and, and things like that. And God just putting me with people like that, man, that's really, that's what this town is about. You know? Yeah. You said, talking about those guys a minute ago, you said they hung around long enough. And I think that's, that's such a thing. And I remember Wade told me one time we, cause Drew and Wade and I played some trio acoustic gigs a few years back for a God, while. Those were fun. Man. That was a good time. Yeah. But I would come in 
and bring in like, you know, my couple of C, the CD or two that I had and like the t-shirts right when I first got them and, and kind of set them up over to the side. And I remember Wade looked over one time. He said, man, I said, Jacob, you're doing, you're doing the right things. Just keep doing them. It's going to yeah. take a while. Now you just got to let the clock tick and just keep going. And that meant so much to me because, yeah, because I'd listened to that in, you know, the, that lonesome song, Jamie Johnson album just wore it out until it broke. I yeah. listened to it so much yeah. and to have the guy that created that to get to play and sing songs with him and know yeah. him as a friend and then have him say those things was, was super cool. Um, so, so you got that publishing deal with that. Who was that with? That was with Anchor Down. With Anchor Down? Okay, yeah. cool. And, and, and it was, a, it was a funny thing cause we had, we spoke that night and we exchanged numbers and, um, and, and they left and, and I thought, and, it, and as we're leaving, he's, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call you, I'll call you. And I thought, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. You know, we've all heard that. And so, um, like three months later, same thing, same bar we're playing. They come yeah. in dinner and drinks. Um, this time they asked for some originals, yeah. you know, so we played them. Same guy? Same guy, yeah, yeah. Same as this publisher, you know. And Did so, he say, uh, oh, shit, I didn't call you or anything like oh, that? Oh, no, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, man. I mean, if it was, if this was anywhere else, he right. would, it, you know. That, it was Lawrenceburg. Yeah, you know, but yeah. in Nashville, you you just, you skip that part of the conversation, right. you know. You don't even have to talk about that. Like, how many times have you heard, you know, we'll, we'll call you, you know. Oh, yeah, We'll, we'll yeah. let you know. Yeah, and and that's, you know, and that was why when we exchanged you know, contact information the first time, I just, I didn't put any stock in it. Right. You know? So the second time they come back. And so the second time they come back, it's like three months later. And, um, we finished the gig that night and this publisher and his wife approached me again, you know, and I said, man, it's, you know, great to see you and hear you again. And, um, you know, we really, really like your stuff. We, we love your voice. Um, let me get your number again. You know, and, and let's talk. Yeah. And I thought, <laughs> why don't you just take me out back? Yeah, right. Fool me once. Uh, yeah, you, you're not going to fool me again. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to uh, uh, shame on. What was that? What was it, George? Shame, on, said shame on me. Shame <laughs> on. <laughs> shame. No, no. Fool me again. Shame but on. Appa- <laughs> apparently it worked out, though. I mean, at it, some it point. It did because, I, I mean, <laughs> so the next day. The next day I, I get up and, and it was, it was exactly like that. I mean, I just, I went, yeah, okay. We, yeah. we did this a few months ago. So the next mm-hmm. day I get up and, uh, I was, I was riding with someone or I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I was somewhere around town and around lunchtime, my, actually it was later than that. I think it was like three o'clock. Yeah. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon. No. Yeah. My phone rings. <clears throat> and it's it's this publisher. His name was Dean Blocker. And um he says, uh he said, Drew, Dean Blocker here, you know, we my wife and I met you again last night at the bar. I said, Yeah, hey Dean, how you doing? Good, good, man. Hey, I wanted to know if you could um if you could come by the office around five o'clock and uh and play us some songs. I said, yeah, man, absolutely. I said, um, I said, I'm not, I'm not at home right now, but I'll, I'll, I'll run to the house real quick and I'll get you a couple of CDs and bring them by. And he said, oh no, 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 no. He said, you, you can bring CDs if you want, but I, we want you to play live for the staff. Oh, I went, okay. And so, um, I, I ran and I got, I burned a couple of discs real quick and, and I made it into town. I get there like right at five o'clock, you know? Yeah. And, um, I, I go in and I take my guitar in and, and sure enough, he's got the staff, which at the time was, um, you know, Phil O'Donnell was part of that staff. Uh, he was a great, incredible songwriter, uh, and producer here in town. And, uh, a guy named AJ Burton, who's, uh, now a publisher, and really successful and one of my favorite guys in town and a few other people. And so we sat in this little room. You remember the little glass room up front? There? Yeah, where we've written a few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we sat there and it's the end of the day and we sat there and I ended up playing five songs for him live in that little room. I was 
I mean, I was... Were you nervous? Oh, I was fucking freaking out. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I just, I couldn't believe that I was there. I was shitting bricks. You shouldn't say that word. (laughs) Shitting rocks. Shitting rocks. (laughs) (laughs) That's better. Um, And and so I I played five songs and they... uh, they said, "Hey, that's great, man. Thank you for coming by. You know, we appreciate it. We'll, we'll give you a call." Yeah, and 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 I mean, it was about that kind of energy as well. And I went, "Well, now, you, now you're like, is it is he is he going to call or not? <laughs> yeah, did, he's, he's done both. <laughs> hey guys, did did that go well? I can't. <laughs> was that was that? Why good? can't you just tell me?" And so I leave there, and so this publishing office is on Music Row, and I drive over to the Tiger Market. Yeah. on Broadway and the interstate. So uh-huh. if, if you're not familiar with Nashville, we're talking like a f- maybe a five minute drive, right? 10 in traffic. Let's right. call it 10. It's, I mean, it's around the corner. Yeah. It's, it's right around the corner, but in traffic, let's call it 10 minutes. And I'm driving my dad's truck because my car just got repossessed mm. and I'm driving my dad's truck and i barely have enough money to to put gas in it but i'm out of gas and i gotta get gas so i drive over to the yeah. tiger market and i've got my phone in my lap you know and i take off my seat belt i pull up into the gas pump i take off my seat belt and i reach for the door handle to get out of the truck and pump gas and when i grab the door handle the phone rings yeah and it's this publisher and i answer and so i've been gone 10 minutes right yeah and I answer, and, and he said, Drew, he said, Dean Blocker here. So just um, just wanted to thank you again for coming by today and playing us some songs. He said, um, I'd like to offer you a deal. Wow. I just and, got goosebumps. That's awesome. Well, man, I've, I've cried like a child in the tiger market. I don't blame parking you. Parking lot, you know. And how does how does that work? I mean, I know obviously you can't just say, "All right, I got a deal, awesome." Like you got to there's then you got to sit down and work <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, there's a the, process, yeah. you know. For, and and for for me, for a guy in his first deal, um, the the process is not nearly as strenuous because it's your first deal. You've you've you have no credentials. It's someone taking a shot, you know, taking a chance on you. So yeah, and for y'all that that are listening that aren't totally familiar with the music industry. It's not a record deal like you hear about, like artists get and you make a record and whatever, that whole thing. It's a like it's with a publishing company, so it's a songwriting deal in which you get, did you get a draw? Like, so you yeah, get, yeah, you, you get, get a get draw, a draw yeah. which is a, um, you get paid per week or whatever uh, for writing so many songs a month. Right. And so, so um, yeah, but, but to be in my, First, like I said, it's not it's not nearly as strenuous because without credentials and all that, there's nothing to really negotiate. They say, okay, here here are the terms of the contract. This is what we'll pay you, and, and that's it. Yeah. You know, after you've had some cuts and you've been around for a while, then it's actually uh, more of a hassle because then you're negotiating terms and. So, in the easiest way possible, explain like the draw thing. Like that's a, it's not really like they're paying you; they're just kind of advancing you. Yeah, it's basically an advance. So, you know what? Actually, Wade Battle told me this one time. He said, "Man, uh, he said publishing deals are are great." He said, "But they're really, you know, a bank." Yeah. At the end of the day, they're they're a bank that thinks you're. Uh, that thinks you write really good songs. And and he's right, because what happens is, is they say, okay, we want you to write, you know, X amount of songs this year. Mm-hmm. And for that, each month we'll pay you X amount of dollars. So yeah. we'll write you a check every month for, you know, this amount of money. And so what happens is, is they, they advance you that money. And so if you, uh, if your songs get recorded and there's any kind of monetary value that comes back, then they, they get that money. They get reimbursed they first. They get reimbursed first. They recoup first. Yeah. And then anything after that is what you get. But anything after that, don't y'all then split? Like, Yeah, there is a split, you know, yeah. because they 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 own, and, and without getting yeah, we don't want to get into too the deep, yeah. gory details <laughs> of it, 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 there are two parts of ownership in a song. Yeah. There's the publishing, and, uh-huh. and then there's the songwriter's ownership. 
So they own the publishing ownership. Now it's it's a hundred percent and hundred percent. Right. You know, which is two different payments, but yeah. right. And mathematically that doesn't make sense, but that's you know well, yeah, when you're splitting a, one thing. Yeah, you know. right. There's so the if money you comes and I, in is two hundred percent, if that makes any sense. And then hundred right. percent goes yeah, it's yeah. Anyway, it's 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 fishy stuff. But there's two yeah. different things. They have part of the rights, you have part of the rights. Right. Yeah. So and so that's really, you know, how it works. And um How long were you with Anchor Down? I was with them for three years. So getting on with with that riding with them is that when you had when did you have your first like cuts by people when did that start happening was that pretty quick or did it you have to no that was actually um that was right at the i got my first major cut right at the end of that deal um which was the randy hauser cut yeah i remember uh when we were recording my first cd Mm -hmm. you had written the song that Randy Hauser ended up cutting. Mm-hmm. But at that time you were thinking like Kenny Chesney had it on hold yeah, or something. Yeah, so Chesney had it. What happens is a publishing company, and this is coming from a still still somewhat ignorant person in, in the ways of all this, but I think the you write the songs and then you turn them in or whatever, and then the publishing company pitches them to different people depending on who's looking for what kind of song and who's recording an album and that. Is that pretty much right? Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. So, yeah, at some point, I think Kenny Chesney had the singer, the, the song, the yeah, singer yeah. on hold. Uh, but Hauser ended up cutting it, and that was towards the end of that. Yeah. End of- yeah, he uh, that record came out, and they dropped me a year later. Or, I'm sorry, a week later. A week to the day. A week after? Yeah, it was a week to a the week day. A week after your Randy Hauser yeah, cut, and yeah. that album, like, I, kicked I, ass? <laughs> yeah, I, I went out and... Um, what, like, five number ones on that album or something? Yeah, it was, like, four number ones, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, I went out and bought it. Uh, I drove down to Lawrenceburg the day that it came out. I went down to my hometown because I wanted to buy it in my hometown Walmart. Yeah, and so that so, was. I mean, that was your first like it's legitimate. my first major cut. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, I drive down there and I pick it up, and a week to the day later, uh, I, they hand me my walking papers. Man, <laughs> what did they like? Did you have any idea they that said was coming? Adios. That's what the fuck they said. Yeah, I I didn't because I I technically had you know a couple of more years on that on that contract. Um, and, and the company, I guess was that, that was the option up like we were talking earlier. Yeah, it was, was, it was, it was the option and they took the option to, to say goodbye, you know, man. um, which is fine. I mean, I mean, it was, you know, so at that point, like, I don't want to get into personal, but were, did you see money from the Randy Hauser thing? Did you, or did you have to recoup? To them, how does that work? Oh, if, yeah, if they dropped yeah. you then, do they still get? Oh yeah, because they yeah. retain the ownership, you know, for, okay. forever, you know, basically. Okay, so they still have their right. percentages of that. Right. So, okay. What about after, like after you leave them, anything you write from then on? Yeah, anything not, you write yeah. from that point forward, okay. is is yours. Yeah, I gotcha. So, like, how is that? I mean. Because it's so different now. I feel like 30 years ago, if you would have got a cut on a major album like that, that it would have probably been pretty lucrative. But how how is it different now, even with the album that had four or five number ones on it? Was it... Because, I mean, so many people now just go buy the single. Like, I like this song. I like that. You know, do you still get... Yeah, well, I mean, to give you an idea, man, you know, 10... Okay, so to, to really set this up well for you, um, the the night before that record came out, yeah, the first single off of that record, which was How Country Feels, uh, hit number one on the Billboard charts. Yeah. Which was great timing. You for, know? yeah. It was for, great hey, timing. Hey, it's number one. The album comes out the next day, yeah. Yeah, and so at like, so at like midnight the night before, we find out that, it had went number one and we go, wow. I mean, this is a, this is a great way to, to, to boost sales. You know? Right. Um, and, and, and again, there were three more, you know, I think number ones behind that, but all that being said, 10 years ago, you know, that record would have went gold and would have went gold quickly. Yeah, that record has been out. That was 2013. That was fe- it came out like February. I think it was like February 23rd or something of 2013, yeah. and uh, we're now in March of 2017. And 
uh, just a few weeks ago, I found out we got a gold record on it. So it took four years man, to, to sell half a million physical copies. Yeah. So physical, that's like... Yeah. Walmart CD. Let's go to Walmart yeah. and buy it. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that. I mean Yeah. So 10, 15 years I ago. I, I, still, was, still I guess at a live I guess at a live show. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So does that that counts for for that, does it? Uh yeah, I guess so. Yeah. yeah, it's got yeah. To, yeah. I don't yeah. I don't know how they, you know, I'm sure keep they track report it. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. well, I'm sure, you know, barcodes and stuff too. Yeah. You know, I guess is how they keep count, but yeah. um so it was a great thing because I I got my first gold record for that, but it took four years where, right. you know, 10, 15 so when did years you get ago. That? You got that not long ago? Yeah, just a month ago. Oh. Yeah. You got it hanging in the house? Uh, no, not yet. It hasn't come in yet. Oh, they I want to see the thing. That's awesome. They, it, it was just certified like a, last month. So yeah. now we're waiting on all the yeah, so big, crazy. you know, the plaques it's just to such get a different, made up. Such a different world. I mean, as like as a songwriter that's had publishing deals and is currently in one, is that make you nervous i mean about the future being so it, it does volatile yeah as far as it, it does because um because people do have the ability now to to just buy singles yeah and and it's it's it concerns me um it's it's you know not just the money or the financial side of it that concerns me but we used to buy we used to go to the store and buy records and we used to listen to the entire record. Yeah. It was a thing. It, it was, was a thing. It wasn't just the song. It yeah. was it was a whole piece of art from the artwork yeah. and the cover to in between the songs to one song to the end. Yeah, it was a whole process. And I th- I think as a result of that, you know, you had a um you had a a greater love and greater respect for the artist. You you felt like you knew the artist more. Yeah. You know, you listen to just one song, it's hard to go, okay, well, I, I get who this guy yeah, is. I get what he's about. It's just kind of like, that song makes me feel good. Yeah, right. I've, I've been by And that's rare. fine. Yeah. Sometimes songs are just meant to just be that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's fine. But I, th- I think the appreciation um, for the artist and for the music itself has has, you know, definitely suffered in recent years because we're able to just go, you know, cherry pick what we want. Yeah, I would think that, I mean, I'm not sure. I would think publishing companies would, would be more, almost more worried about that than anybody. Oh, they're terrified. Yeah. 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 Because, and it's, I mean, man, I, I got my first writing deal in 2010. So, you know, seven years doing this, it's amazing just in seven years' time, yeah. How many publishing companies I've seen come and go, and it's it's because of that. It's because the you know well, you the revenue no is get, not there. Yeah, you can no longer get a B side cut and expect that to mm-hmm. you know garner much money. Right, you know? right, because the the record sales aren't they're just there. Gonna they're, go they're just not there. Streaming, their, streaming yeah. is a dangerous thing for for our industry as well, and. Um, and that's definitely made a dent. Yeah. So I'm going to try to get somebody from CSAC on here at some point to talk about yeah. that whole deal, streaming and yeah, royalties. That's a, and that's a scary thing, you know, uh, if, and, and I don't know the answers. Yeah. The, the tough thing is like, I've got all kinds of friends and family that have nothing to do with the music business. And so if I put myself in their shoes, I totally understand. Oh, I can pay ten dollars a month and, and listen, listen to, to anything, anything I want to listen. And everything. Hell yeah! Right, like every day, all day, I'll right. do that. But I mean, it's just it's just not right for the people creating it. Right. And but you can't ask for somebody not to do that. Right. I don't know. I don't know. It's a weird spot. Like I don't, I don't do it personally, but. Yeah, I don't blame people that you know stream. Yeah, no, I understand I mean, it myself. I get it. I I don't do it. I'm like you. I don't do it myself, but I do understand how that that works for people. Yeah, my buddies yeah. are like because I I tried to explain to them why I don't have a Spotify, you know, the mm-hmm. unlimited and the, or the iTunes music, and they're like, man, that's a great deal. <laughs> yeah, it's a great deal <laughs> <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah, you're getting something for really dirt cheap. Yeah, for the yeah. consumer, it's a great yeah. thing, but for the creator, not so much. No. Yeah. So the the Randy Hauser cut, and then that was a song called "The Singer." 
Mm-hmm. And what, what album was the name? Of, was it the How, is it it was the How, Country. How Country Feels? Yeah, How Country Feels, it? yeah. Cool. So you get dropped from that, and then you're like, well, shit, I just got a cut. And then that, did you like go try to shop around and find another deal? Yeah, or? yeah. I mean, immediately. Yeah. Was it the same um, time you're doing this, you're still playing shows here and yeah, there? Yeah, still doing shows. And, and you're recording and producing and mixing demos and albums sure. here and out of your fantastic studio at your house um it's awesome because i recorded there that's that's not why it's awesome no that's what made it all (laughs) it's got the jacob stiefel juju oh yeah so but you got all those uh, things going on which i believe is uh what you have to do in this world oh you gotta have yeah multiple irons in the fire which is why we're sitting here talking on this podcast right now yeah you know and and honestly i mean as as rough as that sounds um you know about about the record coming out and then being dropped, you know, immediately after as, as, as rough as that sounds, it was really, it couldn't have happened at a better time. If that's going to yeah. happen, you kind of want it to happen. Um, while, th- you know, things are, that's true. Are that's good. a good point. Yeah. Because it's, that gives you've you now got that to momentum, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's exactly, that's exactly what happened with me was I was able to get into another deal pretty quickly because, the record had just come out. The record was performing well. You know, it was a. It a, kept performing well for a while. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was um, when it came. I think it was like a week after it came out. I checked the Billboard Country Albums charts, and it was Taylor. It was the Taylor Swift Red album that yeah. was number one. The new Gary Allen record was number two, and the Randy Hauser record was number three on on Billboard, it's and so we were in great, great company, yeah. you know. Um, but and, but again, because of that, I was able to run around town and go, "Hey, look, I got the number three record on Billboard right now, and by the way, I'm out of a, a deal." Yeah. So yeah. looking for a writer. <laughs> yeah. And and so because of that, I was able to to get into my next deal rather quickly. Cool. So did. How long you were with that one for like a year or so? Yeah, I did a year right? there. Yeah. Any, so I, I mean, is it just kind of like luck of the draw as far as who they send it to and when? And if you get any bites or anything? I mean, it, obviously it, the songs have to be good, but you're a it great It really writer, is, man. So. It's, you know, for song pluggers, and song pluggers are the guys that work for the publishing companies that go out and, and they play your songs for uh, artists and labels and, uh, in order to get them cut. And, you know, really, man, I, I mean, first of all, you need a great song. But even with a great song, it takes um, playing it for the right person on the right day. Yeah. I mean, that's that's really what it comes down to. I believe that. And um, and sometimes you have to you have to play it several times. I mean, there, you know, uh, I think it was the house that built me. I, I believe is what it was, uh, the Miranda single that, you know, had been written 10, 12 years prior to that. I mean, it was not, that was not a new song. Yeah. You know, the guys that wrote that had written that years before, and that song had made its rounds and made its rounds and, and made finally, its rounds. And somebody then finally, somebody hears it and says, hey. Cool yeah, man. and there's, there's a ton of songs that are like that. A, a lot of what we hear it's not something that was created yesterday. Right. You know, a lot of this stuff has, has been around for a while. And that's that's another thing with it, man, is that, you know, like we were saying earlier about, you know, how you've got to just keep hanging out uh, yeah. because it does take time. Yeah, because it's all so much relationship-based and connection-based along with being in the right place at the yeah, right time. Yeah, along with the timing. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, you just got to, it's like, it's like fishing. You just gotta, yeah. Keep throwing the line out, and at some point you bring that, you figure out how to hold it, and it goes in the right spot, and you get a bite, and sometimes you lose it, and sometimes you reel it in, and sure, it's a, um, so all that we talked about to get to, I want you to tell about uh, Merle Haggard. Oh and, yeah, uh, getting the call, um, because the same song that Randy Randy Hauser recorded. Merle, did he hear it himself or did his people hear it? Because he ended up recording that on... Actually, you know, um, Buddy Cannon uh, had that song and, and Buddy had had it for uh, a, f- a few years because it was they were going to record it on Kenny Chesney before, okay. before Randy had it. They were going to cut it on... So he still had a hold of it from Yeah, then. so he still, he still had it laying around 
and he told me that it was, you know, just one of his favorite songs ever. And that, you know, he, he, he's heard a lot of songs too. He's so heard a ton of songs, but he can a, a incredible producer, great guy and, and a great writer himself. I mean, he's written some massive tunes, but, um, so it meant a lot that he, he liked it that much. And so he kept it around, you know, for a few years and, uh, he had uh, he had just cut a record, um, a, a I guess a you know kind of a a duet record with uh, Willie Nelson and Merle Haggard. Oh yeah, um, uh, it's all going to pot. The one that had that on it. Yeah, well, yeah. It was a, uh, what was that? Django, so Django and, and Willie. Yeah, or? Django and Jimmy. Oh, uh, Django and Jimmy. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's early. Um, <laughs> and and so he had just he had just produced that record and. Merle wanted to. He wanted, He was ready to do another solo record. And this was a couple. Was a couple years ago, twenty fifteen. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. twenty fifteen. And he wanted to. He wanted to cut another record, and and he enjoyed uh, what Buddy had done on the, you know, the the Willie and Merle record, and so he he enlisted Buddy to to produce his next record. And uh, Buddy played him that song, and. And he he cut it, and it was uh, yeah. I remember you you were telling me one day about getting that call that was it with Buddy that called you. Yeah. Somebody called you and said, "Hey, Merle Haggard wants to record your song." I was like, "Shut up!" <laughs> well, yeah. Well, what had happened? You didn't believe him or something? What had happened? And you know, for a long time, I had decided not to tell this story just because it's it's it's. I, th- I think it's easy to kind of get lost in in the story and get lost in the reason that it happened the way that it happened. But, yeah. um, but basically I'd, I'd gotten a, a text or a call that morning. I don't remember which that, um, but it was from my agent said, uh, Hey man, buddy cannon wants you to call him. And I said, well, that's great, but I don't have buddy cannon's number. <laughs> <laughs> why? Uh, I mean, why? yeah, <laughs> That's not just something that they hand out, you know. Yeah, they don't give you Buddy Cannon's number when you come into Nashville. Yeah, so, um, so he's oh, okay, okay, man, my bad. So he sends me his number. So I called yeah. Buddy, go straight to voicemail, you know, and I left him a voicemail, and I mean, like two minutes later, he calls back. This is you know pretty early in the morning. Yeah, and um, Buddy calls back, and and uh, I answer the phone, and I said, Drew, Buddy Cannon. And I, so hey buddy, how you doing, man? I'm good, I'm good. And he says, uh, so what are you doing today? I said, well, I guess I'm canceling a writing appointment, buddy. <laughs> what, what would you like me to be doing? Right, yeah. And um, he said, well, man, he said, uh, Merle Haggard just recorded uh, the singer uh, a couple weeks ago. And I said, oh man, that's that's great. He said, um, Merle wants you to. Uh, Merle wanted to know if, if you if there was any way you could come in. We're getting ready to do vocals, and Merle wanted to know if, if there was any way you could come in and you could sing over the tracks. And uh, <laughs> he just wants you to do a guide vocal for him. Wow. And I, I was like... I don't even know how to process that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I said, wait, wait, what? <laughs> Merle Haggard wants me to sing a guide vocal? For him to listen to. For him... On his record, like, yeah, and uh, I, I mean, man, I would, I'd give anything if if uh, the conversation was recorded because I can't even imagine the, <laughs> the, the sound of my astonishment, <laughs> you know. And so I just went, uh, okay, man, I yeah, I, sure, I, I guess, and and um, he said, well, you know, come over to the studio and. Uh, and, and we'll we'll knock that out. And I said, okay. And he said, well, you know where my place is at. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know where you're at. And he said, uh, can you can you come over this morning? And I said, yeah. I said, if you just give me enough time to just jump in the shower real Let quick. Let me put some pants on and yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. And uh, and I'm literally pacing in the hallway of my house, like yeah. in my boxers. And uh, so I hang up the phone and I jump in the shower. And I go over there and... Uh, they play me the tracks and it sounded great, you know, and, yeah. uh, they handed me, uh, a lyric sheet and, uh, or there was a stack of lyric sheets that was yeah. sitting there 
you know, on the console. And I see one of them had some handwriting on it. Yeah. And it, it looked like it was potentially Hag's handwriting. Right. Was it on like the lyrics to your song? It was on the lyrics sheet to my song. Yeah. Ugh. So was it his, do you know if it was his handwriting? Did did you get the sheet? Oh, no, no. So yeah, I'm getting to that. Okay. Yeah. So here's the deal. I, I don't, I'm relatively sure yeah. that it's his because I actually have a picture of him in the studio when they were cutting that song and he's ah. looking at the lyric sheet and he's got a pencil in his hand. Oh, so, so I'm cool. I'm within 99% certainty that yeah. it's his handwriting on, on my lyric sheet. But here's the deal. I stole it. So <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I couldn't really go back and go, hey, buddy, it was this. Yeah, Excellent handwriting right off the table. So well, it worked up. out perfectly because we're we're standing there and I'm listening to the tracks. And buddy goes, "Hey man, do you want a lyric sheet?" And I went, "Oh yeah, absolutely." And I just grabbed that one. Oh okay. And so I, I go in and and I, I cut the vocal and um, I, I cut the guide vocal on it. And so basically, um, that all sounds well and good and all, but yeah. the the fact of the matter is is that it wasn't that Haggard had a hard time, you know, reading lyrics off a sheet or he was having a hard time seeing. It was that he, and we talked about this, and he told yeah. me this himself. He said, I loved the way that you phrased the song on the demo that you did. Yeah. He said, I loved, the, I, I loved your phrasing. And he said, I wanted to, to match your phrasing. That's, a, that's and, so cool. Oh, well, yeah, it's like... <laughs> I mean, I mean, what do you say to that? You know, but that, uh, that's what, what I would have said. Well, it's uh, the ultimate compliment because it's, I mean, he's, he's Merle Haggard. So he, he doesn't have to match anybody's phrasing, Yeah, but he's, you know, Merle was one of those guys that if he really loved a song and he, he really admired a song, he, he wanted to do what was right by the song. Yeah. Do it justice. Yeah. And I, th- I thought that was incredible because it's, it's Merle Haggard, you know? Yeah. So that was his last, the last CD that he recorded. That was the right? last record Before he did. He died. Yeah. Uh, has it been released or is it going it, to be released? It hasn't yet, but from what I've been told, uh, they have every intention of releasing that yeah. record. I think it's really just when a matter of timing. Yeah. We're coming up on the, um, one year anniversary of his death here in just a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say that it's probably, it will probably come out sooner than later. Gotcha. Well, man, if it's a, so you still, so you got the new publishing deal with, who are you with now? I'm with Demolition. Demolition. So you're just writing and. I'm just writing and away. Pitching and, 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 and recording yeah. and still gigging some. Still gigging a little bit, producing a lot of stuff right now. I'm, I'm getting ready to go to Charlotte, North Carolina in a couple of weeks and, uh, produce a, a project over there. Oh yeah, I've been working with um, Jeff Bates lately. Oh, and, what a voice! Man, what a voice! I can't imagine you and him sitting in a room talking. It's it gets like weird. So, so yeah. low and low. Yeah, it, it, it gets weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, we definitely and we write together quite a bit, and we definitely don't write anything that you know Dolly could sing. Right. <laughs> yeah, but um, but he's such a great talent, such a great writer, great artist, and, and a really wonderful person. Jeff has um, very quickly become one of my favorite people in town, and um, he's getting ready to, to do a new record, and um, I, I'm going to be producing that. So, um, Oh, the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah very yeah. cool. So where you, does he know where he's recording? Um, you know, I mean, we've... We've we've talked about it, and we have a few things in mind. We're going to do some stuff at my house, yeah. and and, uh, and and then I, we might, you know, kind of piece some other things together. You know, right? Um, we we might end up cutting at a few different places. We're just we're really not sure yet. We're you know pretty early in the talks, but we've yeah, been man. listening to a lot of songs and you know and, and really discussing the the vision you know, for it, but I'm, I'm really excited about it. He's, uh, he's a, he's a great artist, really great artist. Well, Drew, you are one of my favorite people in town. Oh man. Thank you. Same to you, buddy. Thanks for coming in and talking. Yeah, I man. will, uh, I'll put all this, the shit that we talked about into a notes page that'll be on the website. Nice. Um, anything else you want to, you know, you want 
I think that's Curse it. Curse the folks or anything? I don't think so. They no. seem like good people. I feel like they probably are. Yeah. If you're not a good person and you're listening, you should just turn it off. Go just away. Just turn it off. Yeah. Um, well, thanks, man. Thanks for coming yeah, in. Yeah, buddy. Thank you, man. Okay. Did you learn something? I've known Drew for like seven years, and I still learned a thing or two. And that's what good unscripted conversations do, people. I believe that they help everyone. The help those involved and those listening at home or in your car, on your way to work, in your cubicle. Ow, I just banged my elbow on the table. Anyway, (laughs) thank you to Drew. Thanks for taking time out of his day uh, and swinging by the house here to sit down and talk. I highly recommend y'all check out Drew's music, the song The Singer, which is number four track on Randy Hauser's album How Country Feels. You should at least go download that one song. It's one of my favorite songs of all time, and I would tell you that whether I knew Drew or not. All of this info and more will be up on the show notes page uh, from this episode, which is don'tstifleme.com slash 006. Thanks so much for listening, y'all. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, share with your friends. Once again, any or all of that would be out of this world awesome for you to do, and I would appreciate it more than you could possibly know. If you have any feedback or any questions or you just want to say, hey, whatever, uh, you can email those to jacob at don'tstifleme.com. The podcast's social medias are at DSM Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. My social medias are at Jacob Stiefel. That is J-A-C-O-B-S-T-I-E-F-E-L on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. My merchandise and my tour dates can all be found at www.jacobstiefel.com. And by the way, what you're hearing in the background there, well, that's me and Drew playing uh, a little, some music from the song, The Singer, that I was telling you about. So if you like the sound of that, you know, I'm just kind of soloing and jamming along, but he's the one strumming the beautiful chords over there. Uh, If you like the sound of that, Go check the song out. I'm telling you, you won't be sorry you did. And just like that, yeah, uh, episode six in the books. That's it, people. I'll be back for episode seven, so uh, you should come do the same and hang out with us again. I'll let Drew and I play us out here, and I hope you have a beautiful day, my friends.